All right, welcome. So our next speaker, Tom Eastman, is lead consultant at Safe Stack, and the talk is called Playing to Lose. All right, please welcome him. Hey, so if you don't know me, a tiny little bit of background. I'm a Python dev, um, a very heavy Django user, uh, and security consultant for SafeStack IO as of a couple months ago. So it's kind of a fresh role, and it's an interesting new set of challenges. I'm here today to talk about the scary world we live in and how to find ways to make it feel a little less scary if you possibly can. Who in this room actually does do web application development, either on the public internet or like a private internet, you know, for your company? Yep, so, cool. So, hypothetical question. You get back from PyCon AU and you are told that while you were here, your website was hacked into. So, on a scale of one, two, many, and lots, how panicked are you to hear that? I'll, I'll take that, that's a many, right? Yeah. Yep. So, cool. So, what if when you got back, you were told that you were hacked into six months ago? <laughs> and you only just found out? Right, so that causes a lot of panic. And people are usually scared because they haven't thought about this. It's not so much, oh no, what will we do? It's, it, this has never even occurred to me that this might happen. Uh, it, yeah, so you, you, your, your thought process on this usually isn't much more than, please, no, <laughs> I don't really want that to happen. There is actually a correct answer to this question, to the question, how would you feel if you've been hacked? The answer is, well, it depends. Why is that the right answer? Because it doesn't include panic, for one thing, but it also shows that you've thought about the problem. It depends means that at least you realize that there's levels of how bad this could have been. Uh, what I'm doing today is just leading you down this thought experiment of thinking these scary thoughts and imagining how you'll get hacked is the only way to protect yourself from getting hacked. Thinking about getting hacked is not an exercise in masochism. It's absolutely critical for the safety of your application. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at an imaginary web stack and we're going to think about the different layers of security that could be added based on a thought experiment of what could go wrong. The most important thing to realize about security is that it's not any one thing. There's no single security mechanism that stops all attacks from all attackers. I haven't read the F5 marketing material, but your firewall can't do that. Your firewall can't save you from everything. Uh, one thing can. Unplugging the server, melting it down into slag, and throwing the slag into the Mariana Trench. <laughs> but even then, the attacker will still nab the database backup that you left behind on your workstation home directory. <laughs> Which none of you have done, right? Um, there's more than one kind of attack, and so you have to think about more than one kind of defense. A secure system relies on many defenses in many places. You have to think about who the bad guys are. You have to start imagining to yourself, my site is on the internet, who cares? And why do they want to hurt me? And there's some pretty structured ways that you can go about thinking about this sort of thing. And you want to consider any hypothetical person, what their motivation might be, what is driving this individual or group to act, what resources they might have, including money or access to people or systems, and what is their skill level. So just as a really simple example, set of examples, opportunistic script kiddies. Anyone who's running a website online probably just sees a million automated scans, a lot of attacks. These are the people who are trolling the internet for low-hanging fruit, something that they can get into, an unpatched WordPress, a whatever. They, they're, you can make some generalizations. They're probably pretty unlikely to use financial resources to attack you. They probably don't care that much. But they're dangerous because they have all the time in the world. They're doing it for fun. They're, they, they're hypothetically just in it for the lulls, which is a technical security term, I believe. <laughs> But they're in it to make a name for themselves. So that's a fairly specific class of threat that you have to think about. Then you've got organized criminals. These people are usually specifically out for some kind of financial gain. They're skilled. They may have financial resources that they will expend on attacking you if they're organized. And 
their motivations are usually financial as well. So they could be after extortion. They could be after credit card numbers if you're an e-commerce site of any description. They could be after a database leak for using your account information to get into other systems. They could just be in it to DOS your site for blackmail. Disgruntled former employees. I want to emphasize that this can happen even if you are a lovely place to work. So disgruntled former employees, their motivation is, well, they're disgruntled. It's right there. <laughs> Get the thing. Um, but they have an intimate knowledge of the system that you built. They may well still have credentials. They may, st they may well have left themselves a back door. So this is a really dangerous threat. And you have to at least consider what is the worst thing that can happen. You've got hacktivists. They might be after making a political point. And you might have nation state actors. Um, they have infinite resources. They've been in the news a lot lately. And they probably don't have any motivation. But it really depends on your use case, doesn't it? You can and should formalize the process of thinking about these experimental people. If you're familiar with the idea of personas in agile development, where you create an imaginary user, and that imaginary user might be going to your company's website to look for careers, or going to your company's website to try to purchase your company's services, or something like that. You, you invent these personas. You give them names and motivations and skill levels. You should do personas for bad people, too. It doesn't come up very often, but you should have in your thought process when you're thinking about your application, people who very specifically are at your website to do harm. So a few, for, for the last few years, I've been building a web application for teachers on behalf of the New Zealand Ministry of Education. The attitudes towards the tool that I was building were quite polarized. The uh, relationship between the teachers in New Zealand and the ministry is fraught. Uh, there could be political reasons why someone might want to attack the system. It's a gov it was a government application. It was a government website, so there's always a lot of people who just want to embarrass the government. Um, this being a tool for teachers, though, probably one of the number one threats I would have to face is just this, the, the boring old threat of teacher walks out of the room, student leans over, and, and the teacher has left themselves logged into the system. What, what damage could a student do if they just commandeered the credentials for five minutes? That's an example of the sort of persona that I needed to think about while I was constructing this. But for each of your applications, you'll have something similar. So beyond the people, you want to think about the scope of the attack surface of your system. I'm just going to read the uh, Wikipedia definition of attack surface verbatim here. The attack surface of a software environment is the sum of the different points, the attack vectors, where an unauthorized user, the attacker, can try to enter data to or extract, da or extract data from an environment. The, the TLDR of that is every single place where there could be an interaction that the user could affect is a part of the attack service. And you have to think about all of those parts and work out what damage could be done at any one of those spots. What I am going to do is go through a bit of a tour through a typical web stack and think about the consequences of a hack happening there, how it could happen, what the consequences could be, how you could have reduced that attack surface, and how you end up mitigating it if it does happen, things you could have done to mitigate that sort of attack. Like I was saying before, the firewall solution simply doesn't work. If you think about only protecting the outermost layer, it's, it's devastating because it all goes downhill from there. So how might a layer of the stack get compromised and by whom? Consequences? Yeah. Let's see. What will I wish I had done back when I had the chance? That's the key reason why you actually need to go through this thought experiment. Because once it has happened, all that hindsight, it won't make you feel any better. Let's talk about the web server for a second. 
So your web server is probably some combination of Apache or Nginx. Both have very large communities behind them. Both are mature and well-tested pieces of software. But it's also pretty obviously the most exposed part of your infrastructure in a web application. It's the thing that everything's going to hit. Any bugs discovered in Apache or Nginx will be automated and exploited quickly. If someone finds a code bug in Nginx in a zero day or a Apache pre-auth something happens, those things will be automated by attackers very quickly and they'll just scan the internet as quickly as possible for anyone that they can take advantage of with that vulnerability. Both of these pieces of software are pretty mature. That's actually not necessarily the biggest threat. However, what we have seen is things like SSL bugs, Heartbleed, Poodle, stuff like that, right? So there's definitely scope for issues at this layer. How do you minimize the attack surface of your web server itself? The number one thing to do is always keep it fully up to date, fully patched on a preferably a supported operating system. Disable all of the unused modules and configuration that you might have. In my experience, that's a lot easier with Nginx because it kind of starts with a really minimal configuration, then you enable stuff. But a lot of Apache, um, a lot of distribution Apache versions tend to come with a lot of modules enabled with a lot of functionality already turned on. A lot of that stuff you might not realize is on. You might not even need it. And this piece of advice is really just if you're not if you're not a crypto nerd or a highly experienced sysadmin, find someone else to, to, to tell you what your SSL configuration should look like. Don't actually rely on, you know, there's, there's a million options of, of ciphers and hashing algorithms and versions that you can use. And there are tools like this uh, Mozilla one which give you a pretty decent default configuration. You go to that website and it'll say, do you need to support IE6? In which case, you have to leave some stuff enabled that you'd rather have disabled. Do you, are you writing your configuration for Nginx or Apache or Apache version 2.2 or 2.4? It'll give you a snippet of configuration. That's a reasonable default. Um, some sysadmins that I work with lock it down a little further than that. They have their reasons. But in, in the absence of other information, that's a pretty good place to start. How would you mitigate a web server breach if it happened? Let's say a zero day actually happened. Someone got in. They now have, because it's probably a C application, they probably have code execution on your web server. That's a scary thought. But if your application server is not running on your web server, then that hasn't gotten them as far as it might otherwise have. Who, who came to my talk yesterday on Django deployment? So this is one of the main reasons why I am now a very firm believer in keeping your application server on a completely different VM or container or some fully different level of segregation. The next step that you always want to think about is there are techniques for operating system level lockdown. Uh, I'm a big fan of AppArmor. Who knows what AppArmor is? AppArmor is a, I think, still Ubuntu-only no, Debian has it. Rob, can you tell me? Uh, Debian AppArmor? No idea. OK. Um, AppArmor is a declarative language that, you can, that applies a lot of operating system level checks in place. You can say, the Apache process is not allowed to run bash. Right? The Apache process is not allowed to access, make external connections the Apache process or any process that you want, you can set up a profile saying it's not allowed to do this stuff. If someone's already got code execution on the Apache server, that will very quickly limit what they can do from there because the first thing they'll want to do is get shell execution. Then they have full access to your operating system, can do whatever they want. If you can be alerted to that by an AppArmor rule saying, hey, Apache doesn't usually uh, try to run bash. We should email someone about that. Then you'll find out before they've managed to do damage as long as they couldn't get immediately to your application server. You'll also want strict firewalling from that server. Uh, it surprises me how often outgoing firewalls remain disabled. But your web server does not need to talk to the internet. 
your web server needs to receive connections from the internet. Your web server needs to be able to make outgoing connections to your application server, your logging server, and the security updates, and nothing else. Why would you let it go anywhere else? You certainly don't want it to be able to SSH anywhere. So let's talk about your application server for a second. Application servers are usually written in a high-level programming language like Python. And so at least generally you don't have to worry about buffer overrun or C-style attacks, hopefully. But the attacker could achieve arbitrary code execution through your application server still depending on what you've done in your code. A common way that they might do this is compromising any system commands your application server runs. So for example, if you are doing image manipulation in your app server running Python, maybe you're shelling out to ImageMagick, you're using some sort of external tool for that. That's often a mechanism where if you don't very carefully control the execution, if you've uploaded a file and the attacker can control the file name and then the file name is passed to the shell execution, that could actually result in them being able to inject commands into the shell. So it is possible for a reasonably simple mistake in your application server code to lead to shell execution. The more likely attack against your application server code probably involves compromised login credentials. So someone being able to do a session attack or a session fixation attack or somehow getting a hold of credentials through a man in the middle attack in order to get the user, get account credentials for someone who ought not to have it, or more scary, an admin. If they can get admin credentials, then you've got a real problem, right? Especially, like, I do a lot of work in Django. What can't you do if you have a Django admin account? They could also use the application server to inject cross-site scripting attacks, but we'll be talking about that a little later. So how would you mitigate a code execution attack if it was launched against your application server? The same app armor rule applies. You also want to make sure that your application server in general can't do any more than it needs to do. If you don't actually have to do file manipulation, uh, if you aren't uploading, if you aren't receiving files in your web app, then Ideally, your application server wouldn't even have write access to any files on your entire operating system. A Django app, if it's been set up properly, can run as a user with no privileges. It only needs to be able to receive connections from the web server and make connections to the database server, make connections to your cache uh, server, uh, make outgoing connections to your logging server. It doesn't need to touch the file system. That can help a lot. Again, whitelist egress firewalling is critical because you need to see if something else is going on, going out there. And yeah, I'm a big fan of AppArmor. At least once, the, AppArmor is the last line of defense if they've already gotten into something. Mitigating a credential theft attack, it's a little harder. If they've already got the credentials, IP address restriction on admin accounts is one option that you could have done beforehand that meant if they got the credentials they couldn't do anything. Two-factor authentication in general is a wonderful thing. It's probably critical protection if you have a lot of information available from an admin credential and you, if you actually need that to be accessible from off-site or, off, or from any IP address, then you really want to think of some other layer. So the consequences of an application server breach are pretty scary because that you have to assume that the data store has been compromised. The application server usually has full access to the database. Customer information may also have been lost or tampered with. And incident response and forensics will become critical. You'll really need to be able to have some way of retracing the timeline of what happened. So let's, speaking of the database, as you get deeper, it starts to get a little bit scary. You kind of hope they wouldn't get this far. But how would attackers get as far as your database server? How can they do it without even having to compromise any your app application? You leave a port open on the internet? Either that or they came in from somewhere else in your office. That one's pretty easy. Um, SQL, injection. SQL injection. Okay. 
SQL injection means that your, app, your application server isn't doing what it ought to have done. It should have protected against this, but this bypasses the application server entirely and gives someone full command access to the database server. This is the number one threat in the OWASP top 10. It still is. It has been for years. But there's other less obvious but certainly devastating attacks to your database server. Um, as, as, as we mentioned, it could have been lateral movement through one of the other servers. If you had the ability to SSH from the application server to the database server, maybe they'd just go straight in, um, assuming they had gotten into the application server or the web server. Um, but actually, database backups could be compromised. Where do your database backups go? Do they just go to S3? Do they go somewhere else? Are they sitting on a development or staging server? Do you use your production data in your pre-prod servers or during your tests? Because those might be in your internal network, but they're usually a little bit less protected, and you might have database dumps sitting in your home directory. I do. Um, if they've gotten as far as command execution into the database, you've got a real problem. You've lost the database again. You can reduce the privileges of the account used by the application server to reduce the amount of damage they might be able to do. Django expects the ability to create tables, though, um, which means that it usually has the ability to drop tables. Hopefully, it doesn't have the ability to create databases. And hopefully, you haven't let it use an admin level account to talk to the database server. So for example, if you're using MySQL and Django is talking to MySQL as root, then the root user in MySQL, it's a very quick jump from there to shell access. The root user can do all kinds of things like run SQL statements that will spawn shell accounts. Uh, post, the Postgres user in Postgres can do the same thing. The Postgres user can, the admin user in Postgres can enable untrusted languages like Python, and then you can just run Python code on the database server as Postgres, and that's always bad. Um, the number one way of minimizing this attack surface, though, is never ever allow code even with the potential for SQL injection into the application server. You have no excuse anymore. Every framework that you do any development in in the modern world allows you to make parameterized queries or query binding. SQL injection is infuriating because it's, it's the closest of all of these problems to completely solvable. You can absolutely protect your application from SQL injection. I'm not actually going to go into detail on SQL injection today, but if you don't know about it, then talk to someone who does. Talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to explain it. Uh, it's a very valuable thing to learn. And find a way to not use production data or production databases on your dev servers. If you treat your dev servers a little bit more casually, which you, might be able to, which you might do because you're running them on Vagrant on your laptop or something, I really hope you're not using real live data on that same circumstance. Always know exactly where all your database dump files are. The data has been breached. Unless you have some kind of sharding architecture, you probably have to assume that all of your data could have been accessed. I don't know if a sharding architecture would even save you from that. And yeah, it probably means shell access or worse to the database, to the machines running the database server. OK, so, let, so let's change tack a little bit and let's talk about the web browser layer. So who has a passing familiarity with cross-site scripting attacks and what they basically mean? OK, that's really handy. Um, the canonical example for a cross-site scripting ex uh, attack is someone adds JavaScript to a comment field and then that posts that comment to your site, and then when a web browser goes to that site, it actually runs that JavaScript. This can be used to launch attacks on other people who go to your site, but the more insidious kind of attack is your admin, who's logged in as admin, goes to the site to go, oh, people are saying this page is misbehaving, and it's got a cross-site scripting attack in there that then executes as the admin who's logged in as admin on the site. And then if you're in Django, you would just quickly send a request to uh, have a new admin account created with credentials of your choosing, and then bad things happen. So what are the consequences? It could be website defacement. It could be used to attack users of your site, compromising their accounts, like I was just saying. You could attack the admins of the site. It's, it's a rough problem. 
how do you minimize the attack surface? This is unlike injection. This one's solvable, but there's no one solution to cross-site scripting. The most important thing you can do is do whitelist input validation on all user-generated input. And I, I want you to read that line again because that's actually pretty much the golden rule of all web security and maybe all security in general. Like if you take nothing else from this talk, if you take that, if you say, the user has sent me some data, let's make sure that it only conforms to the things that I'm expecting, that's about as well protected as, yeah. That's the golden rule. If you start there, everything else is gravy on top. You need to escape all data appropriately for display. So that's the protection on the way out of the database back onto the site to make sure that that script tag that someone embedded in a comment is escaped so it can't actually be interpreted as JavaScript on, on side. Sorry? Link problem or something. Yeah. Who's familiar with content security policy? Excellent, not enough people. This is one of the coolest tricks in modern web browser security. Cross-site, ah, sorry, content security policy is an HTTP response header, and it lets the browser know where it is allowed to load JavaScript from. And the, one of the first key default settings of content security policy is, by default, it will not allow JavaScript to be run inside the HTML. So if you have HTML, and you have a script tag in it, and that script tag has some JavaScript in it, it won't run on that browser. So there is no way for anyone to inject a cross-site scripting attack in there. You uh, whitelist, content security policy blacklists everything, and then you whitelist that you want it to be allowed to download JavaScript files from the originating server, or maybe from the CDN where you're getting jQuery from, and then nowhere else. And then it won't allow you to run JavaScript that was injected into the page or from any other third party. And it's the same sort of thing for fonts and images and basically any other kind of object that might be loadable into your page. So this is an incredibly powerful tool that really does shield people from cross-site scripting. It's hard to set up because if you have a legacy project that already relies on a lot of JavaScript in your, in your HTML itself, you have script tags in there and that's just a part of how your HTML has been written, then either you have to allow that rule, which means that you lose one of the key protections, or you have to spend a lot of time doing refactoring. But if you have any Greenfields project that you're starting, start with cross-site scripting fully, fully on and only whitelist what you need. You will be far better off. The bad news is that it's only a mitigation, not a cure. Content security policy only protects people using recent browsers. If you're running Chrome and Firefox, you're in great shape. If you're running Internet Explorer 10 or 11, I think it's still considered experimental, and you have to use a header with a different name. It's like X content security policy instead of content security policy. So it's not a security solution on its own, but it's an excellent layer of defense and depth. And it has one other incredibly handy bonus feature, which you definitely want to know about, which is content security policy violation reports of the people who had their hands up before. Who's ever used this? This is so cool. So content security policy normally silently blocks execution or loading of any content that violates the policy. But this includes an option which will force the browser to send a violation report as a little bit of JSON to an endpoint of your choosing suddenly your customers' web browsers become your allies. If someone actually injected a cross-site scripting attack into your application, you'll have an early warning system because as soon as one of your customers or, or viewers with a modern browser sees that, you'll get an alert on your website. So where, what we're doing here is we're just throwing out ideas of what's the worst thing could, that could happen and how could we make sure that it couldn't have gotten as bad as, yeah. Let's talk about something a little scarier. What if someone got your infrastructure as a service keys? How could this possibly happen? That's a pretty dangerous one, yep. Thank you. <laughs> People, okay, accidentally committing AWS keys to a GitHub repository. I'm not going to ask anyone to put their hands up if they've done this, but 
I happen to know that someone in the room has. If they're fast enough, I don't know if it's a pre-commit hook yet, but um, this happens all the time. This is really bad news. Automated scanners are constantly searching public repositories. They're constantly searching paste bins and GitHub and anywhere, Stack Exchange is a great one. Um, they're all scanning those. They're looking for keywords like begin private key and AWS secret and any of a hundred other different key phrases. And it's gotten so bad that um, Amazon have their own bots constantly scanning paste bins and GitHub and, and looking for keys so that they can immediately lock them down and email the owner saying, hey, stop it. <laughs> um, and, and so do you know for a fact that GitHub itself is doing that? Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I've, I've heard that Amazon does its own scanning, and I've, I, I feel like GitHub must be doing something, but I've heard no confirmation of that, and I would love to know for sure if anyone, if anyone knows. So what are the consequences? It could be absolutely catastrophic, right? Do you, do you want someone to be able to delete your entire data center in one go? This is, this is the culmination of cloud functionality. You can, you can go, actually, I don't like this data center. Boink. Um, it must be a gigantic relief then that most of the times that this happens, actually all they do is spin up 100 VMs on your machine and mine bitcoins until they get caught. <laughs> so, so this is one of those cases where it's like the worst possible thing that you could ever allow to happen. And usually what happens is Amazon will call you the next day and go, hey, are you aware that your bill has jumped by $5,000 in the last 12 hours? And also, if I understand correctly, Amazon will usually give you one free pass. They'll like, they'll like, oh, okay, yeah, no. But then the next time you're, you know, it's like you, you, you need to look after that yourself. How do you minimize your attack surface? Sorry? That's a good start, but you, you can't do a git ignore for a, gra a regular expression, can you? Um, you could put in a pre-commit hook, but anyone, anyone who's put in a pre-commit hook to look for an Amazon key being committed to a Git repo is already aware enough of the problem that they're not gonna do it anyway. Um, you, can, you can reduce the exposure by creating sub-credentials. Uh, sub I don't know the terminology with Amazon, but you can, create, you can create access keys that have limited privileges, and you should, especially if you're doing anything clever with um, continuous integration or something that like spins up servers, run tests, and spins them down again, you want to make sure that whatever credential is using that sitting in some Jenkins box somewhere can only do that and can't do anything more dangerous, like delete your entire S3 bucket that had all of your company backups in it. How do you mitigate this if it did happen? <sighs> I mean, this is, this is some worst case scenario stuff, right? But just Make sure that it's not all there. Like if your, if your business continuity relies on restoring your backups from S3 back to your EC2 instance and it's all in Amazon, then it all could not be in Amazon at the push of the wrong button. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done with this kind of morbid thought experiment, right? But I hope, I hope what you're realizing out of this is that there's things that you can have done beforehand that would have, that would have saved you and it's up to you to sort of assess which ones are worth doing for your circumstance. And some of them are easy enough that you just want to do them. If you're starting any new project, use content security policy. Look into it about whether it's worth doing otherwise. And if you're not using Django Forms to do your whitelist validation and you're running a Django project, then you've got problems as well. But what other things, in the, if the worst thing happens, will you wish you had done back when you had the chance? You'll wish you'd had better logging. Finding out you've been compromised is pretty horrible, but far worse is finding out you were compromised a month ago or three months ago or six, right? Um, your default log rotate. How long is that keeping those Apache logs around? In Ubuntu, the default one is, I think, weekly logs for a year, all sitting in var log, but it doesn't matter because if they've compromised that web server, they've compromised your logs. The most important thing that you can do after a compromise is reconstruct the timeline of what happened. And if you can't trust your logs, or if you don't have your logs anymore, then, you, then you've got nothing, right? You just have to rebuild everything and, and hope that you caught whatever, however they got in. So, 
One thing that I would highly recommend is that you attend the uh, talk on the Elk Stack, which you can't do because you're in this room and he's giving it next door. Um, but some tool that ships your logs somewhere else where they are hard to see and then you keep them for a ridiculously long time because they're just logs and they're zippable and, and you'll wish you had tested your backups. I want you all to assume that your backups have not worked since last time you tested a full restore. When was the last time? No, I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> Three months ago and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but does that mean that you still haven't bothered fixing it and retesting it in the last three months? Yeah. Possibly worth a polite, a polite query in that direction. Um, modern cloud orchestration has had kind of a profound benefit in this case because it means that we're much more likely to actually use either our backups or if you're designing your cloud infrastructure correctly, then hopefully that means that it's designed so that you can pull the plug on servers and rebuild servers and you have your data back in some way. If, you, if you're living in that mindset, then maybe it's a bit more consistent. But but where does your core data live and how do you get it back in a real tragedy? Uh, your backups are only as good as your last test restore. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I, I feel like the word backup should never have been used. It should have been like restore points or something and then all the backup software would actually have to make the point of knowing that it was restorable somehow. So to prevent the worst, you have to actually plan for it. You have to go down this thought experiment. You have to be as paranoid as you can and then go, actually, if that happened, we would just reboot the application server. Or think about you know, how important any of these pro mitigations are to you in your case. I have large government websites where it's pretty critical. I have a little website that just shows pictures of kittens. It's a little less important, right? But you just have to know where you're going to put that investment of protection. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, what do you think of the idea of using microservices to split out that sort of I.O. vulnerability? You were talking about Django and don't talk to the file system unless you're storing files. What if that spat out to a separate service that spoke to the file system? So the user can never actually speak to the thing that speaks to the file system ever. It's good, separa sort of. it's good separation, but it's also a huge investment, right? So that's, that's of course, a gigantic architect possibly a gigantic architectural shift. I would, say, I would say it's one of the benefits of using a microservices architecture, perhaps, but not, you wouldn't want to have to re-architect everything just for that benefit. You, you, you need to, if you, if you attended the Yelp talk, um, one of, the, one of the things is it's, it's just a massive investment to implement that in the first place. So that, possibly a good layer of protection, but also it's, a, it's one of those things where it's like, do we have enough money to throw at that sort of problem for that sort of mitigation? Um, that was a really good talk. Um, what about, you, you talked about setting up Nginx or Apache correctly and then mm. having a separate app server. What about the Wisgi server or say you're running Nginx and then behind that you're running twisted web to run your application. Uh, is there problems there and how do you mitigate that? Because I'm not sure that twisted web have what they do from a security perspective. If you don't know what they do, then you better assume the worst and you better hope that a lot of your protection is coming from the Nginx or whatever your front end is. I don't know about twisted and I don't know a lot about you, Whiskey, either. I know that Green Unicorn in their documentation makes it very clear that they're not providing a security layer from a lot of attacks. Uh, they, they, in Green Unicorn, they talk about um, slow loris attacks, which is that typical thing where you might make a connection to a website and then just never bother making a request and try and saturate all the TCP connections. Green Unicorn very specifically states in its documentation, it doesn't protect you from that. Green Unicorn relies on Nginx receiving the full request and then passing it on to Green Unicorn when it has the request. Green Unicorn will send the response back. And, and so, Hopefully they're being honest with you about what they do and don't do in that sense and hopefully bugs get patched quickly. Go with one that you didn't know is well maintained because it is an important piece of your infrastructure. Someone's got to be responsible for that code. 
if you can't rely on the upstream to make a, a, a security patch, then maybe you need to think about the risk of that. Tom, thanks. Yes. Uh, that's a great talk. Um, just y y you touched on two factor, and just to kind of have a comment and a question. Yeah. Um, just about the AWS credentials. Yeah, like you said, lock it down to whatever, but obviously the admin credentials that can create those obviously needs two factor so that you know you kind of protect yourself that way. But for Django specifically, and since you do a lot of Django work, have you used or can you recommend anything for like locking down admin? two-factor-ish? You know, it's got to exist, but no, I haven't used a tool for that. So in, in, in a couple of my cases, I had um, an additional piece of middleware that I had just written, which was whitelisting on IP address for admin users. Um, and that was the second factor enough for my needs at the time. Um, sorry? I'm going to assume yes, but uh, if someone could, if someone who has used one of those, like that sort of thing is basically an authentication, uh, a, a Django authentication backend and maybe an app on, on the Python package index away. So I can't point you at one, but I'll bet it exists because the Django infrastructure, the Django architecture makes it very easy to write pluggable authentication backends. Hi, Tom. Hey, where'd that come from? Hey. So, um, yeah, it's, it would be scary to have my website hacked. It would be far more scary to have it hacked six months ago. You talked about having um, forensics there and having the logs off site so we can follow that path. But what is there anything else we can do, like canaries or something like that, to find that along the way? Or hopefully, like, if I was hacked when I just launched a site and someone's just mining my data forever, like, what can we do to prevent that sort of, like, it's it's a difficult situation, but is, can we go back and do you recommend audits as you go? Or depends a lot on the resources you've got. You know, if it's a if it's a pet project, some of my pet projects sit on servers, and I kind of just hope they're okay. Um, and that's the investment that I'm prepared to put into them. Uh, being alerted about the right things, like it, it might be as simple as um, what is it? Watch logs or watchdog or something, where it's just looking for interesting regexes in, in the logs that you do have. That's, that's a cheap and dirty way of doing it if you're not actually going to bother shipping your logs to somewhere else, if you're just running like one VM somewhere. Um, there, there's basically, there's, there's solutions from the, from the really quick and dirty and cheap way of just sort of being emailed if something showed up in the logs that worries you or worries a regex. Um, all the way up to you know the Splunk and the Elk and the the really high end log monitoring stuff that costs five hundred thousand dollars a month, which you probably don't want to do on your on your kitten's website. Um, I so will we'll go three logs and say you had this many HTTP hits, this may have happened. These people logged in virus the same thing as your disk users. That sort of thing. Yeah, that's a good start. Um, and if it's being emailed, you, if it's being emailed to you whenever something weird happens, like oh this person used sudo. Um, you'd know if it was you, and you'd certainly go, whoa, wait, what, if it wasn't you, right? If it's a, if it's a one person operation, then that sort of thing becomes pretty easy to know if something unusual is happening if you're just, if you're looking. But the temptation is to not look. The temptation is to just, you only look at your access logs when something's broken. You only look at your error log in Apache if your Apache server is not responding for some reason. Hi. Uh, two things. So there's Django two-factor auth as a Django package uh, that does Google Authenticator. Cool. Um, and secondly, CSP can be run in report-only mode. So if you have an old site, you whitelist the things you think quickly and then just run it in report-only so your users won't see a failing site, but you'll get reports about the things you forgot. So you can build up your kind of whitelist uh, based on activity without uh, ha harming your users. The only thing that I would add to that, though, is that you don't want to just turn that on off the bat because each one of those reports is, at least when I was last using it, was a JSON call on its own. And so if you actually have a couple hundred cells in a table where each one is running a little bit of JavaScript because of your legacy app, those 200 connections outside that your web page is suddenly trying to do to your server is bad for its browser and you. 
Uh, you, rec uh, you mentioned that you're a fan of App Armor. Um, is there any particular reason you would uh, suggest that over SE Linux? Mm, honestly, because all of my infrastructure has been on Ubuntu. So that's, I, I really should have, I, I meant to mention SE Linux. SE Linux is the natural alternative if you're using Red Hat or Fedora. That's the one that the Red Hat sort of ecosystem has, has gone, that's the road they've gone down. App Armor was a canonical initiative, I believe, that is now adopted by Debian. Okay, um, but yes. Yeah, so SE Linux is exactly in that same space as App Armor. Um, I haven't used it, and the scuttlebutt is that App Armor is a lot easier to configure. But those are those are equivalent sort of layers of security. Unfortunately, he beat me to the point about SE Linux. But there are some very neat modules with SE Linux and Apache where you can actually have per URL context, so you can have it so that certain pages run in different process confinement, which means that they, so a file upload, only that one URL has access to write your file system and every other URL does not. So you can actually do per page confinement within SE Linux. So maybe that's something as well to investigate and have a look down because that's really powerful. You can also do per page database access controls and things like that with it. So, cool. you know, that's just a bit more commenting. Unfortunately, I was beaten to the punch, so. The other, the other thing I'll say about AppArmor as well is um, on a modern Ubuntu, a lot of packages come with AppArmor profiles, but they're reasonably permissive. If you have a look at the AppArmor profiles in the Etsy AppArmor whatever directory, you might see a lot of extra things that you can uncomment to lock it down further. Maybe some of those are just things that you can uncomment, lock it down, and, and have better security right off the bat. Fraser. Yeah, you mentioned that you weren't sure whether GitHub would allow you to push um, private keys and whatnot. Oh, did you uh, just try? Yeah, and uh, it let me, so. Sweet. Yeah, that was a PEM encoded RSA uh, private key, but if it lets me do that, then it'll let you do probably any other sort of key as well. So, yeah, beware. SSH keys are one that they always search for as well. That's always very useful. <laughs> you mentioned lots of script kitties being out there trying to search for low-hanging fruits or sure. whatever. Um, I know that there's a couple of firewall implementations that do um, specific active known bad IP address lists. Um, mm. By chance, I just stumbled across PFSense, and they seem to have a blocking module that blocks the top 20 from whatever, but I haven't read up too much on it. Do you happen to know how effective these are? Um, are they even worth looking at, or? No, I better, not, I better not pretend to know for sure, but my gut feeling would be you could take out the top 20 or 20,000 IP addresses, but they'll be constantly finding people who they have attacked and then will be just mounting attacks from there, right? So the majority of SSH login attacks, they're just looking for another machine from which they can proxy further attacks from. So again, this, the whole point of this talk is every layer that you can add and afford to add, the better off you'll be. I certainly wouldn't rely on that on its own though because it just, yeah, you'd, you'd be reducing the noise, but you wouldn't be shielded from everything. Fair enough. I was wondering if you had just a couple of comments about how you do the um, management to, to keep your uh, very, very important credentials safe um, in your work. We use LastPass. Um, and that's actually, you know, the fact that it's cloudy aside, it's pretty good security. And they handled, they had a breach recently, and it was a worrying breach. And they handled it seemingly pretty maturely and you change your master key and your master key is hopefully huge. Um, but not to promote any specific tool, the key thing is just knowing where it is everywhere. So all of my passwords, I have a couple in LastPass, my, my work stuff, but most of mine are in KeePass and I know where that is. 
if you know where all that stuff is, then you can make an objective assessment about whether it's in a safe place. But the first question you probably need to ask yourself is, do I even know where all of my passwords are saved? Are some of them, could they be saved in browsers over here? Does, um, do half the people in my organization actually know the domain controller password because they needed to install software at some point and they just told someone the password? The, 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 first, the first thing I would do is try and audit where those credentials are in real life and then work out where they ought to be in a perfect world. All right, we might wrap it up there. Cool. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you.